Welcome to this second session of the Asset Colloquium. I'm Shudipto Maiti speaking from TIFR. And we just heard uh, about songs and stories about songs. What this session is about is about stories. Stories about the language on which these songs were written in or sung in. So if you ask a neuroscientist colleague of ours, you'll see that a mother tongue is not really learned. It's actually part of development. And I think this is why it tugs at our heart. This connects us across geographical boundaries, across time, as you had just heard, uh, Moshumi talk about songs from the 1930s, how she felt connected. We all felt the connection that she felt across time. So this is a language gives you a powerful sense of identity. And when you feel that identity itself is threatened, it can also be a powerful call to arms. This is something that some of us on this side of 50 um, witnessed when we were children. And a whole new nation was born through a bloody war whose name has the language as the first part, Bangladesh. So about 51 years ago, Bangladesh became Bangladesh. Actually, it's less than that. It's about 50 years ago when that became a reality. Today, we'll explore in this panel discussion some threads taken directly from Moshumi's uh, colloquium and going into how powerful that sense of language is. How powerful was it in shaping the war, shaping the movement? We'll hear about some stories of our own memories from that war. We'll hear about the participation, very interesting stories of participation in that war of people on this side of the border, on our side of the border. And we'll also hear about or think about the movement that started with so much bloodshed and so much human suffering 50 years ago and given, had given a shape to the country. Where is that sense of identity now? So to discuss this, I have with me some of the people who are very, very unique in their ability, abilities to talk about it. Let me first introduce Salil Tripathi, and you can see Salil uh, waving his hand from uh, New York City. So thank you for joining us, Salil. i really, really thankful for that you could make it. So Salil Tripathi is a writer and a journalist. And his subject is a very eminent economic journalist. You'll read about his, um, uh, read his pieces in places like the Wall Street Journal, the Far East Economic Review. Also in our country, uh, Mint and uh, Caravan. They are some of the things that he regularly writes in. He is a member of the board of PEN. PEN, P-E-N, is the Association, International Association of Writers. And a very specific information, he was the chair of the Writers in Prison Committee. And he has this distinction of being banned by Twitter for a long time. And that's, you know, it's a badge of honor I consider. And uh, of course it cuts both ways. But I think he is, you know, you couldn't have had a better qualified person to talk about the Bangladesh war because one of the many books he has written is on Bangladeshwar, the colonel who would not relent. So that's Salil Tripathi. He is the winner of many prizes. Okay, I would not go into that, but we are really lucky to have Salil joining us 
uh, from across the globe. The other panelist here is right next to me and absolutely knows uh, needs no introduction uh, because he has spent more time in this institute than I would probably ever uh, do. So this is Pushan Ayub. Professor Pushan Ayub was still very recently, till three years ago, uh, was a celebrated professor in the Department of Condensed Matter Science and Condensed Matter Physics. He is a nanoscientist, well decorated, is a member of the National Academies, etc. But the reason that he um, is here, and he has been he has been here and talking about his science many, many times. He gives wonderful lectures. But that's not the reason he is here today. He's here because it's you know some of that underground network that ran through West Bengal, through Kolkata, supporting the movement in uh, Bangladesh in the 1970 and 71 ran through his house because of who his parents were. Okay, he's the son of Abu Sayyad Ayub and Gauri Ayub. I'm sure he will talk about that. Again, he was a child at that time, but he will hear some stories about that. It will bring you back to what a war was and what a war that was. And in general, what a war means. We are living through one of those wars right now, though for, thankfully we are not part of it. And of course, we'll have Moshumi talk about it at different parts. And uh, all of you are here for that, so I'm not going to reintroduce Moshumi, and she has been introduced. So we'll start at this point. There are four things that I will try to take this discussion through. I will be the one who, is tr who will try to, you know, keep things on check so that things finish roughly in an hour. And uh, but I'll also look around to you if you have pressing questions. And please raise your hand, I'll try to pick it up. And somebody would be I guess in the zoom session looking for hands if necessary. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can stop at right moments and talk about it. The four things that we'll uh, discuss the first thing is of course, coming from the language what part did it really play in the uh, revolution in the war and this is something that is important for us to understand because the fourth topic will come back to it where is that country now as we see it where is that ideal of centered around language or the sense of identity because there are other competing senses of identity that comes and takes their places so we'll like to see across 50 years what has happened to that but in between, we'll go to um, the war itself, our memories of the uh, war, and little snippets, and of course, how people um, supported it. The intelligentsia from uh, this side of the border supported it. We'll hear about it from Pushan. So I'll start with uh, Salil Tripathi. Salil, this is a question I'd like to put to you. What role do you think really the sense of identity that is through the language, through the mother tongue, through Bangla, what uh, role did it play in the war and the revolution? You start. Thanks a lot. And I wish I was there in person at, at your wonderful campus. So thank you for inviting me. And I'm sorry I can't be there in person. And um, I'm sorry to have missed out the events that took place earlier today as well. A uh, couple of thoughts. Um, nation as a concept rests on the notion of identity. Uh, people come together. If we go back to what Benedict Anderson speaks about in, um, uh, in his book called The Imagined Community, basically we imagine ourselves to be who we are because of certain unifying strands. Um, the guiding point for the creation of Pakistan and India in 1947 was the assumption of religion. The fact that, you know, if you were Muslim and from the subcontinent, then you belonged here. And if you were Hindu, you belonged here and two different places. Uh, clearly, um, um, the Congress did not immediately agree with that idea. And, you know, in India, at least, the idea was it was a Muslim nationhood versus a secular republic. That, that was the governing idea uh, that was a part of what was called the idea of India and imagining India in 1947. That was part of the assumption there. What we need to bear in mind that in, 
in what became Bangladesh, the eastern wing of Pakistan, the language was always very important. We do look at 1971 as a starting point for the war, but we do need to go back to early 1948 when the provincial assembly meets, the, the national assembly meets in, in Pakistan with Liaquat, Liaquat Ali Khan as the prime minister. And they had a parliamentarian from what was East Pakistan called Dhirendranath Datta. And it's instructive to note that not only, uh, I mean, it's very easy to dismiss him as a Hindu person, which is what some people in Pakistan immediately, West Pakistan immediately started doing. But his argument was very clear. This was when the decision was made to make Urdu the national language and uh, Urdu and English as the two languages. And um, Datta quite clearly said that, look, if you're a small farmer and if you go to a post office in uh, rural Bangladesh, what is now Bangladesh, how will you understand the form if it's written only in English and Urdu? So there is a need for an equal recognition. Now, we have to remember that at that time, there were more people in what is now Bangladesh than what is now Pakistan. I mean, Bangladesh was, there were more Bengalis than non-Bengalis in the entire country. And therefore, the demand for giving Bengali the respectful space it deserved was a justified one and a, and, and a realistic one. But um, I, I mean, if you look, look back at what Jinnah and Liaka Telekhan told Dhirendranath, that was exactly that, that, you know, you are sowing the seeds of dividing the country. And the demand was rejected. After that, Jinnah comes to Dhaka, speaks at the campus, students protest against him. And again, Jinnah has a very negative response saying that, no, there is one nation, one language, and which also has deep resonance and significance today in India with the kind of politics that's going on with Hindi, which is, which is a long-standing story. I mean, it goes back to 1960s and, you know, the, the movement against it, and it's taking another form altogether with a lot of other combinations. But that's not what we want to get into right now. Staying focused on Bangladesh, what happened was that in 1952, the language movement took root. And on 21st February, that's an important date to mind because the world celebrates it today as the as the you know international mother language day as it calls it um and and if you look at that particular context uh, it's very clear that you know in the international mother language day uh, it came about because the police opened fire at the dhaka university campus now once something has taken place many many years ago this was in 1952 once something has taken many many years ago there's a tendency to embellish and exaggerate the story so people will say hundreds died and dozens died probably between eight and 12 students died immediately. So we have to, but, but you know, I want to go back and just quote one particular um, uh, song by Abdul Ghaffar Chaudhary. Amar bhaiyer rokte rongano ekushe February, ami ki bhulte pari, which basically means that how can I forget 21st of February splattered with my brother's blood? Now, when that kind of response happened, it sowed the seeds of the, assumption and understanding among Bengalis that we were different, that we were being treated differently. And later that combines to many other ways. And, you know, people are always, I mean, I still remember a story that was told to me by a diplomat where um, uh, this is after, after Bangladesh is an independent country. And one, one, one Pakistani diplomat asked a Bangladesh, but why were you so hung up on Tagore when you have Nazrul Islam? At which point he said, we are lucky to have both. So this idea of both was very important. And I want to quote a, um, a Bangladeshi poet uh, called, Bangladeshi American poet called Tarfia Faizullah. I've quoted her several times. She's in my book and elsewhere, where, you know, this is during the time when Bangladeshi women uh, who are still East Pakistani women, and there were at close to quarter million instances of rape during the war. And I hope we get a chance to address some of those issues later. And she writes this poem about a particular woman being harassed and beaten up by a soldier. And this is the conversation. Are you Muslim or Bengali? They asked again and again. Both. I said, both. Then rocks were broken along my spine. My hair, a black fist in their hands, pulled down into the river again and again. Each day, each night, river, Rock Fist. It's a very powerful poem from a collection called Scene. And, and it's, it's something worth bearing in mind that, uh, and, and, and it's, 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 it's tempting to say that it's, it's a Bengali nation, but as a lot of my Bangladeshi friends tell me, and Moshumi knows the country so well, she will also add to that. 
is that you know they always saw themselves as bengali and muslim just as they were bengali and hindu then bengali and santal then bengali and christian then other but but bengali was an extremely vital part of that nationalism and that was being pushed aside to that later you talk about economic exploitation you know which uh, dr rahman soban writes about the six point charter comes out of the awami league because so much of the wealth of um, uh, it was almost like neo colonial model where the wealth that was generated in the east was going away to the west and people in the east felt we are poor and rural and not well looked after precisely because we are we are being exploited that was a very strong sensation and feeling also among bengal so you have language as a starting point to that the assumption that you know they did want bengali regardless of your faith to be treated as bengali and pakistan was getting more and more islamicized and and on top of that you have the economic exploitation and the sense of grievance and then of course the storm who happened do bola in 1970 and then the elections and and that's that's very closely linked and an extremely important story i don't want to take too much time and get you into it, into it right away but we have to recognize that the 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 awami league the party of east pakistan did win close to 160 out of 162 seats the national assembly at 300 seats so by any reckoning they should have formed the government the pakistan people's party of zulfikar ali bhutto had about 82 or 83 seats it's in my book i don't remember the exact figure of hand and therefore mujibur rahman should have been invited to form the government and you know the 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 generals decided what generals tend to do which is to cancel the election and and after that the events that followed were inevitable and we can go into it later as we go along thanks that brings us closer to 1971 what i really would like to know i was really curious about that in a war <clears throat> which is also a people's movement it's sustained by this call to arms and that goes in goes out from the leaders to the masses through slogans songs poems and other media in this did the bengali identity play a role or was it by that time also mostly the exploitation angle that you talked about but well, the bengali identity was extremely important in that i mean exploitation certainly fed to it and it contributed i don't want to say one is vastly superior than the other but the bengali identity is a starting point and and it's that bengaliness and you know in even in terms of talking about how we pakistanis are fair skin the bengalis are darker we eat wheat they eat rice we eat meat they eat fish we are you know herdsmen and swordsmen and they you know are like, like in rivers and boats and you know and 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 you know tinier people and there were some very racist uh, comments made by general yaya khan and there's a like, the horrible statement made by one of the generals that we want to change the genetic profile of the country by having more non bengali children uh, to put it in very polite terms in that society so all of that builds on that exclusiveness that the bengalis felt or the bangladeshis were feeling yeah so of course the rising happened uh, much before the actual war started and i think this is the period where there were you know of course mujib was jailed himself and taken to pakistan but there are other people his leaders were under threat and some of these and and the intellectuals of course always as in all wars are right at the you know front of the barrel of the gun And, and they were the point. first victims if you remember they were the first victim when the killing start in 1971 on 25th of march when operation searchlight is announced the killings really started at the dhaka university campus and one of the first martyrs and this is a justified use of the term martyr uh, was uh, professor jyotirmoy guha thakurta uh, who was correcting exam papers and but his daughter megna tells me this very vivid story with which i begin that chapter where he's correcting exam papers and these people come in and ask whether this is professor guhata kutas home is taken out and then she hears this shot she is 14 or 15 years old at that time he dies two days later and and if you look at the list of people who are taken out and killed uh, i mean you know the, there's a revisionist view going on today in india that this was a quote unquote genocide against hindus um which is simply not true it was it was a mass killing and atrocity and crime against humanity against people who believed in bengali nationalism and the 
largest number of people who died happened to be Muslims. I mean, I'm not saying that they were devout Muslims. Some of them were secular, some of them were leftists, some of them were liberal. So I don't want to make, give it a, the religious color that is being given today to that conflict uh, in India. That as though it was Pakistan Muslims were coming and hunting down Hindus in Bangladesh. Um, that's simply not true. This is not to say that Bangladesh is a great secular society today. There's a lot to criticize about it. But at that time, the attack was on anyone who was Bengali in that complex where uh, uh, Professor Guha Thakuta lived, the first seven or eight martyrs, there's a nice little plaque of their names. About four or five are Hindus and four or five are Muslims. And that's exactly the way the conflict played out. I'll come back to you, Salil. But at this point, I think I will go to Pushan and see what he remembers about these, uh, you know, Bengali intelligentsia being attacked. And some of them, I think, were seeking shelters across the border and seeking help from across the border. So some of the stories from you, uh, Pushanda, what do you remember? And give us the context also. Yeah. Uh, am, I, am I audible? OK. Uh, thank you, Shudipta. Uh, so uh, before I come to 1971, as you, as you, as you uh, wanted me to, let me remind one thing that uh, Salil of course, it talked about you know what what had happened since uh, the independence of in India and Pakistan. He gave us a very uh, balanced view of what happened. But let me also remind you that Bengal was also once partitioned in 1906 on uh, you know on completely religious lines, and the expectation was of Lord Curzon. The expectation was that uh, because it is uh, partitioned on religious lines, it would be stable because the uh, Muslims were slightly sort of oppressed by the Hindus before that economically and uh, in, in the society. They would be happy to have their own homeland in, in, on the eastern side. But what was surprising to the British and what was one of the very few things that they had to revoke was that uh, uh, there, was, there was so much uh, sort of, uh, you know, protest about this that the, 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 the division along religious lines were, was actually overtaken by the unity that came because of uh, because of, uh, of of language, and that was that was when language actually won against uh, religion the first time, yes, and then if, twenty one the seeds of that were sown in nineteen oh five exactly exactly so we should not forget that, and that was maybe a few generations back, and that still remained till nineteen seventy one, so let me come to nineteen seventy one and what what happened as Shudipto says uh, in our house. It sounds a little bit like uh, the red-headed league that you know you have underground tunnels uh, uh, through our house and all that. Not not that dramatic, but uh, still I can sort of remember a lot of very interesting things happening. One of the things that uh, that happened. Let me start with this because Salil already laid the sort of groundwork for that. What happened on 25th March in Dhaka? So on Dhaka, a lot of intellectuals were killed in in the Operation Searchlight in Dhaka, and within a few days. The number of people dead in, in Dhaka itself was close to 25,000. And out of that, a lot of them were the intelligentsia, the, 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 the sort of people who could lead the revolution in the absence of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman were, were actually killed. A lot of the poets and a lot of the writers were killed. A lot of university professors were killed. And as he also indicated, it was again across the religious lines. I mean, both Muslims and Hindus were killed at that time. It was based on being Bengali and based on being able to support the Bengali movement against the, the Pakistan, Pakistani army. So that was that. And uh, at that time, uh, let, me, let me sort of zero in on one of the people that we know about. Uh, one of the, I would say, three all-time uh, well-known uh, Bangladeshi poets was uh, Shamsur Rahman. And Shamsur Rahman, at that time, uh, sort of escaped this this sort of genocide of of of, in, of the intelligentsia that happened in 1971 on on the 25th of uh, March. So he stayed in his home for the for some time. He wandered around, uh, stayed stayed in other people's homes, stayed stayed in uh, in in the in the outskirts of Dhaka and all that. But he kept on writing. He kept on creating poetry all the time, and he was very very prolific at that time. Within a month or so, he had maybe about uh, uh, close to about 100 uh, poems written on, on the, mainly on, on nationalism and the, and the Bangladesh uh, war that was happening at that time and about which the people, even across the border, was not, uh, were not so well aware. So what happens, uh, what, he, what, he say, what he recalls in, his, in, the, in, the, in the introduction to one of his very well-known books is that by, by the end of April, 
uh, he had he was he was he was full of poetry. He had written down a lot of these in in a, in a diary which he was hiding all the time. He met two uh, Bangladeshi Mukti Fojis, uh, the freedom fighters who had come to his house. They were all, both very very well known uh, sort of generals of, of the Mukti Fauj at that time, and they uh, heard his poetry. And they said, "Wow, this is this is absolutely astounding. Why don't you give it to us to to read to the to the Mukti Fojis in the in the in the camps? I would, we would like to take this to them." And they did take take them. the The idea also was that they would take it across the border to West Bengal for for it to be publicized in India. So they did, they took it to the to the to their camps. It was widely read all over all over in in all the enemy camps. And then by uh, by May of that year. They, they, you know, they had sort of free access across the border at that time, and they came across to, to Calcutta and they handed over uh, 37 poems uh, of uh, Shamsul Rahman to my parents, to my father and mother, with the uh, request that you know Shamsul Rahman has, has asked uh, him, them to help publish them in, in in journals or in other places in in Calcutta. So they did it, and they found the poetry very powerful, and they published it in in uh, several Bengali journals called like Desh or Omrita and other, other things. And uh, of course, they could not use his, his name because he would be immediately uh, sort of uh, you know, hunted down and killed if he, his name was used. So uh, my father coined a, a pseudonym for him. The name was Muslim, Muslim Adib. Muslim Adib in Urdu means uh, in Bengali. Uh, in, 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 in English, it means a tormented poet, Nirjati Tokovi. So it, it was under that name that it was published for the, for the, for the first time, these, these poems. And then these 37 poems uh, got turned into a book called Bondi Shibir Theke. So Bondi Shibir Theke means uh, from the, uh, from the pr uh, prisoner of war camp or something like that. So this, this book also was published within the next year. And this book became one of the iconic uh, books that, was, that were published in the, in the Bangladesh war. And it made him sort of much more famous than he already was. And he became sort of the de facto poet laureate of Bangladesh uh, after that. So this this connection came from 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 there from my from my parents and it was sort of accidental that they he handed over these poems to him and maybe because it is it is about language uh, if you give me a, maybe a minute I can read one one paragraph of one stanza of this of this poem because the power of poetry yeah, which yeah, is yeah, yeah, the yeah. thread that we have running through the whole discussion. Thank you. So this is the title uh, poem of uh, of Bondi uh, Shibir Theke. So I will uh, read uh, read the poem, uh, read one paragraph of the poem, one stanza of the poem, and then translate it line by line. I could not find a good translation, so I did the translation myself. I hope you find it okay. So it starts with Shadinata Namok Shabduti Bharat Golai Dipto Charon Kore Barbar Tripti Pete Chai, which means the word freedom. How dearly I would love to say it out again and again in a voice loud and deep. Shahorer anache kanache protiri rastay olite golite rogin sign board protek barite shadinota namok shabdoti ami likhi dite chai bishal okkhore. In every nook and cranny, lane and by lane, on every gaudy sign board on the walls of every house, would I love to write freedom in letters large and clear. Shadinota shabdo ato priyo je amar kokono jani ni age. Uchiye Bonduk, Shadinata, Bangladesh, Eiboto Shabdoteke Ora, Amaki Bichitno Kurirakche Shorboda. The word freedom, never had I realized that I love it so deeply. Pointing their rifles, they try to keep me apart from such words as independence and Bangladesh. So this is just one paragraph. Thank you. I will, so I'll come back to you um, for more stories. And uh, so some of you must have lived through the time. This was my, my first introduction to something called war. So I was all of seven years old. And suddenly I saw, you know, I grew up in a little town, very orderly town, University Township. And I remember hordes of people walking down highways, reaching places where it was not occupied, there was probably an unoccupied building, a dilapidated building, platform, train station, bus stations, and with vacant eyes, half-fed, tortured, kids in their hands, 
walking along and this was something that really was startling i mean this is something that i didn't know you you know kids grow up go to school of course there are poor people but there are also there is an orderliness in this whole thing so suddenly this flood of people because i grew up something less than 100 kilometers away from uh, what is now bangladesh and soon my dad says dad started going to the camps distributing because he was a university professor distributing milk solids and things like that and he used to take me along sometimes and i'll be here holding something like a chocolate or some sort of nutritious food packet handing it to somebody exactly my age and i could see the feel the difference and i remember thinking that how can humans do this to other humans that's of course always has been the question about war and there is a side of the war even if you're standing for good or standing for evil ultimately war is probably not a solution but in this case at least this thing escalated and you know then there are sirens the first time the only time luckily that i've had to have uh, sirens and uh, you know blackouts and the lights would be turned off because there will be um, the foreign um, the, the air force trying to bomb us it was all a bit of bit surreal but it 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 is, leaves a deep imprint in you and this human suffering is something that i kept asking and it was not very easy to understand at that time but i'd go through my life thinking about you know what is war and what is happening and you'll connect that to of course what is happening now you see pictures from ukraine coming up but uh, anyway luckily this was a very short war that ended with what at least most of us think as the right side on winning and there was the birth of uh, the new uh, country bangladesh but i will go to moshumi now and see if she wants to say something of whatever her memory is about um, the war uh, because i was sort of disconnected with his body remember it was still startling but this is all i remember really from that time when did you uh, learn about it and what did uh, what was your feeling about it well, uh, I must have been about the same age as you, or I mean, around that. So uh, we were in Agurtala, and that was one of the, also the key places where um, the forces were gathering and there, was, there were training camps in Agurtala. So for the Indian Army was training the Mukti Bahini. And it's a border place with Kumilla. So um, that is when my father was. Um, um, no, actually we were in we were in Agartala from from sixty eight to seventy. So that's the seventy one. Yeah. So that was the four years, I think, three years. So I remember quite clearly. Actually, I remember quite clearly um, sounds. I remember sounds, you see. And uh, uh, sounds uh, such as, or do I remember them? Or have I been told about them and I remember them now? I'm not very sure. So, is there a, is there a distortion? It's tolerable, I think you go ahead. You go ahead with is it okay? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but I remember, I don't know how much I remember, I actually remember and how much I think I remember. So, um, but I do know that uh, there used to be planes and there used to be bombings. And I remember the story that my, one of my father's colleagues, uh, so uh, the, the, the tap, the, the, maybe the hand pump was outside or maybe the well. So he'd had dinner and he'd gone to wash after dinner. He'd gone out and the bomb fell and he was killed. So this happened like within people you knew. See, and so that's a very strong something that I remember. So when I wrote Joshua Road, uh, the song that uh, I wrote for Tariq Masood's 
a film. And I wrote it based on um, uh, Ginsburg's September on Jasso Road. So what you're describing is a bit like Ginsburg's September on Jasso Road because that was that's what we felt that Ginsburg comes and like you you're seeing it from the outside, but Tarek's film had to actually look at it from the inside. So it, this, that was not a translation when I wrote the song. It was based on the poem, but it be, had to become our own song because we had to see that place, we had to be in that place. We were not seeing from the outside. So when I, when I wrote that, you know, um, so shato shato chok akash ta dekhe Shoto, 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 manushe. Dudha. Kada mati jol, kada mati makha, manushe dol, gada gadi hoye. Akashta dekhe akashe boshot mora isha Ura bolo kake ghar hin Ura ghum ne chokhe Juddhe chinno ghar bari desh Mathar bhitare bumaru bimaru that was the plane that had bombed my father's uh, colleague, you see. That is the plane that I'm writing about. Mathar bhitare bumaru bimaru kanora kabe habe shesh. So I think it is those sonic impressions from your childhood. You don't really know whether you heard it or not. but. Mm -hmm because you are reliving that experience because your life has led to that history or to the exploration of that history in a different kind of way if i had not gone to bangladesh if i hadn't had that kind of a living experience and a life in bangladesh i don't think i would actually hear those sounds in quite the same way as i do them now yeah, it is actually that that's such a vivid picture of what I actually remember seeing as a child because it's Joshua Road which actually runs through north of Kollani where I grew up and exactly the picture that you describe in that song is as I remember seeing and connecting across now 50 years. At this point I'll take a little stop and see if somebody in the audience wants to recollect something or do something I'll just carry the uh, microphone to Kajuridi. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, of course, uh, I am slightly older than uh, Moshumi and uh, Shudipto. So, back uh, during uh, 68 to about 72, we were in Krishnagar. I think uh, even Gautam Mandal, he was also there in Krishnagar. Both of our parents were in the uh, government college, professors in government college. So, we remember really very uh, horrible at least i remember very horrible stories and you can imagine going to the school so we, every morning we used to hear so many things so many murders have taken place everywhere and then Ravindra bhavan Ravindranath statue was uh, massacred and various things happened so one day while going to the we used to go by uh, rickshaw our government school for the girls were quite uh, far away and we saw uh, trenches were being uh, dug first of all i did not uh, know what it is but uh, then we came back and my sister and we used to go in a rickshaw then my father explained and as you said Shudipto quite often we and in the school after about a few days we were trained to go how to go under the um, desk in case there is bombing etc so all these trainings were being done to us to all the schools and uh, of course uh, we were living very near by the hospital municipality hospital and it was uh, horrible things and uh, every day we used to hear so many things we were always very scared many things happened i don't want to take your time but uh, you know 
at the same time, we had cousins uh, in uh, from Shantiniketan. The, it's okay, we have family connections, and through from the, those cousins, we also learned a lot of songs. And one of the songs we forgot. It's uh, more than 50 years back. Now my eldest sister, unfortunately, very badly bedridden, she remembers, and she has written without anything because of this Ukraine war. All the of us are, of course, very much disturbed. So. Before I knew all these things, and I sort of had mentioned, she had written recently in our WhatsApp group message the song she, she remembers. I don't want to sing, but I just want to read out. Ridae Rakturanga Shudjo Zhale Akashe, Sharvohara Janutar Zindabad Badashe, Lokho Kanto Kanto Lokho Hok Mukhor Mukhor Hok, Joluk Briddho Torun Bokhete Jodip Toshar Nalo, Kallolito Pranodi, Pranodi, Pallobito Mon Prashaka, Shurobito Shubashe, Shubashe. So, these uh, songs uh, run long. I don't want to sing now. Another thing I wanted to also say is that Mujibur's um, yes, were also being, records were also being sold in Bengal. And in our ancestral house in, um, the, during our summer vacation, I remember that, yes, that used to be quite often the case that my father and cousins, of course, it was a joint family, and quite often we will be listening to various songs, be it classical records, whatever, Bargula Mali, etc. And those summers, we used to listen to Muji Mujibur's lectures. And we, I remember, of course, uh, we were mostly used to playing, doing things, but my fathers and uncles, they were always talking about it. So all these are really very vivid, and I don't know. Thank you so much. That was so nice. So that song was from uh, 1971 or that time? Oh, I see. Okay. That's fantastic. Yeah, right. Yeah. Lots of things happening in Bengal at that time. That's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. So anybody else wants to join in? I know somebody who also was close to Joshua Road. Yes, just so this is Lokesh Trivedi. Okay, Sudipto, so good to get a, get into the memories of many, many years back. I mean, this is something very exciting days of our generation. I think those days, we are, of course, those schools, primary school those days. And uh, this is a very interesting combination of time. 1968, 60, 69, I vaguely remember one or two killings near our place where I used to live, but those are related to political killings in West Bengal, which was quite a lot that time, as she said, that these are the time in parallel in Bangladesh war, at the same time, Naxalite war, <clears throat> so-called revolution, very much in parallel, and there are so many killings going used to go on. Regarding Bangladesh, what we remember in those days, in the evening, always radio, if you switch on the radio, Tomra Amake Dabai Rakte Parvana. <laughs> famous quotation by uh, our Muzibur Rahman and it was recorded of course before he was taken to Pakistan and then uh, Radio Bangladesh so called I mean that nobody knows where was the Bangladesh radio at that time perhaps somewhere in uh, Kalani or Kolkata or somewhere it was we don't know so this is one and uh, the other thing we used to see as a child we used to see that in the evenings or afternoon many many planes I mean there's like a nice array actually and we used to count how many are going that side and how many are coming back next day we used to debate whether it was really same or is less and uh, the other thing is we used to have very good football players in our place and many of them of course that time we were flooded lot of people as Sudip to say lot of people used to come from bangladesh refugees sharanarthi so some of them of course many of the relatives are here in in our places and their all houses are getting filled actually by some friends or relatives they used to come some of them are wonderful football players wonderful actually i still remember i mean i was so small i still remember their names actually some of them two three times they came after that they goes back to bangladesh and come back and actually they were part of the uh, Mukti, Jod Mukti Jodha in the force and some of them actually never came back after that I mean that was very sad but it was really a generation that uh, this uh, particular evening radios and uh, Amar Sunar Bangla songs I mean, in the evenings and these are exciting days I mean this so Bangladesh fight has become like common to kind of uh, all of us part of looks like all of us are part of it either this way or that way somehow like that and at the same time Almost at the same time, there's a huge Naxalite movement. A lot of people we knew, our 
okay, near and near our dearers and family members and so on are so affected. P police used to come to the villages and so on, and all the younger people, those I mean, younger means of course they are the youths, they ran away from the villages here and there because whomever they'll come, they'll catch them and they'll take them away. So these were, of course, those days are hopefully gone, but. Anyway, thank you for this discussion, and I never thought that I have to get into this memory. Okay, good. Thank you, uh, Lokeshda. <clears throat> okay, so um, we um, go back to the last point of the discussion, go to the last point of the discussion, which is, you know, it looks unusual that an idealism based on the mother tongue actually leads to war and a new nation is born. However, as it happens in most revolutions, the idealism results in something, but ultimately what comes out of that is not, doesn't have a one-to-one -one correlation. And this is true for all human movements. I can talk about the color revolutions in the Middle East and other things. So it would be nice to just uh, see and go back to Salil and ask what his reading as a journalist, as an economic journalist is. Of course, Bangladesh as a country has really prospered in a, in a relative sense, if you look at the metrics. But the sense of identity that was based on language that Amra Muslim, Amra Bali. Which side, or is it still that balance that, that is there? Or what is his reading about it as of 2022? Salil, over to you. Sure, I will. But uh, I, just before I do that, since we are talking so much about songs, I just want to refer to one other use of song, if I may. And I'm just reading that one paragraph from, um, uh, from my book, which is that on August 13, 71, at a predetermined time, Akashwani played a song from India called Amar Putu Lajke Prothom Jabe Shoshur Bari, which is that my doll will go for the first time to the in-laws home, which was actually a coded signal to prepare for the operations for Mukti Bahini. So uh, that was the role Akashwani was playing. And the next day, another song was played, which is Ami Tomai Jato Shunye Chilam, Gantar Budle Chaini Konodan, which is that when I sang all my songs for you, I wanted nothing to return. So there's a, this very interesting notion of using music in other ways to send coded signals to, to Mukti Bahini, which I think is worth noting in the context. And I'm so glad, Moshu, you sang the Joshua Road. But this whole idea about, you know, whether Bang Bangladesh is Bengali or Muslim, the conversation about it has moved in fits and starts within Bangladesh. So when, when the country is formed in 1971, the assumption is very much a very secular nation, which is you know basically Bengal for everybody. And it has its own problems. I mean, if you look at the whole crisis that the Chakmas have faced and the Buddhists have faced because all the Silites who feel very strongly that they were different language and different culture, that's also worth bearing in mind. The Khasi and the Garu, all those languages are spoken there as well. And, and that becomes a bone of contention that is Bengali nationalism subsuming. And, I, and there's a whole deeper and far more controversial issue of Urdu speaking Bangladeshis, you know, those who were called Biharis, uh, those who at the time of partition had come from Bihar into uh, Bangladesh uh, or what was East Pakistan, there was a whole, whole idea of seeing every one of them as a potential collaborator. But again, you mentioned Tariq Masood and he has made this other film, Moshumi, you will remember about the barber, you know, who is a Bihari barber. And then uh, that uh, barber actually protects a particular uh, Mukti Jodha. Um, so I think there are lots of layers and nuances which are worth bearing in mind and in the language politics. But given that you do have a situation where secular ideology prevailed until the assassination of Mujib, and slowly over the next 10 to 15 years, uh, the erosion of that secular ideal and making Bangladesh into a more Muslim society, that started prevailing more. One of the things that happened at that time, if we look closely, is the declaration of Bangladesh as an Islamic republic. The other is this happened in Arshad's time. Then the other thing that happened is declaring Friday as a public holiday and not a Sunday as a public holiday. Increasingly, people use the slogan Bangladesh Zindabad rather than Joy Bangla and wearing the, the, you know, the Patani outfit. Um, the man who killed Mujib 
um, uh, uh, the men rather who killed Mujib. I did interview one of them who masterminded it. And that's the title of my book, The Colonel Who Would Not Repent. This is Colonel Farooq Rahman. When I interviewed him in 1986, he was wearing what would, you would argue as a Patani outfit that's more well-known and more common in, um, in West Pakistan than, uh, or Pakistan rather, than in Bangladesh. So there is, there is that you know, change in identity emerging already. And yet there is this core. Now, whether it is only the Dhaka Shushil Shomaj or beyond that, my argument is that it does go beyond that because I've seen so many instances of Muslim Bangladeshis who have gone out of the way to defend Hindu Bangladeshi neighbors during the periodic troubles that have emerged over time. And they're not on a, as vast a scale as it is being pay, played out in, 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 uh, in, in the context of uh, India, when people are saying that every Hindu in Bangladesh is in danger. But yes, there is indeed, uh, there are Indian atrocities committed, uh, you know, destruction of temples and um, a Hindu being held up under, you know, uh, fomenting hatred among, uh, among, among religious communities and so on. The kind of lawsuits, spurious lawsuits are being declared. Just it happened like two weeks ago with a school teacher who was a rationalist and he was being challenged by the Islamic student. So yes, this tension remains. The tension is strong, but I think the secular roots are still extremely strong, and which is one reason why the backlash against it, and I dare say the backlash against it at a national level, of course, it's a smaller country than India, is far stronger than the backlash that we would expect from secular Indians about what is happening today in India. So I think it's something worth bearing in mind about how, how that, that identity question is being played out. Um, I, mean, I still remember that when the fifth, I think it is the 15th amendment in the constitution that was passed about trying to declare that Bangladesh is an Islamic nation and a secular republic. And there is a, 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 a fundamental divide in that phrase that you can't be a religious state and a secular state. You can be a religious state that tolerates other religions, but you can't use these two notions, which are in a way fundamentally opposed to one another in one sentence. But I think that's the compromise Bangladesh has had to make because while Mujib and his ethos was successful in 71, by 74, 75, he was not getting, his popularity was waning. And that's why he was, the, when, when the coup took place, um, the outrage, the public outrage was muted compared to what one would have expected when someone of his stature was killed. So it's worth bearing in mind that there is that undercurrent where there is indeed religious fundamentalism, people are blaming the mosques being built with Saudi money and so on. A lot of Bangladeshis are working in the Middle East. Some of them are getting radicalized. But therefore, to assume that it is becoming a fundamentalist society, I think is strictly not true. Maybe I'm seeing it with rose-tinted glasses, and it's only my opinion, but that's where I am. Pushan just... <coughs> Thank you, uh, Salil. Pushan just um, told me about a, a little story about... Um, one of the main actors in that Bangladesh coup. So I'll like him to recount the story. It's a very interesting story. Okay. And a story that apparently ends with a slap. Okay, we'll I'll go not, to that. I'll, I'll not go that far. Okay, we'll not go that. Okay, fine. Go ahead. So again, again, uh, thank you, uh, Salil, for laying the groundwork for, the, for this uh, story. Again, this is, a, this is an anecdote because I was sitting in the middle of it, so most of my Memories are actually anecdotal and uh, things that I've seen myself. So this is the story of uh, not not Colonel Farooq, but one of his henchmen, one of his four colleagues, uh, Major Dalim. Yes. So Major Dalim was in our house for a long time in, in 1971. We, we, we knew him quite well. So the story starts when he was actually Captain uh, Shariful Haq in the Pakistani army. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a captain in the Pakistani army and he was stationed in, in, in Baluchistan, that is on the other, other side, that western side of Pakistan. And by March uh, of 71, he could already make out that the Bengali of officers and men of the Pakistani army were being sort of sidelined. And he was a battery commander, but he was made into a sort of uh, adjutant to, to one, of his, uh, one of his senior officers. And he and four or five of his, uh, of his colleagues decided to uh, escape from the Pakistan army and, joy and come over to India. So he, he tells this, I don't have time to rec recount it, but he tells this hair-raising story of how, you know, they, they left one, one, uh, one weekend night and traveled across pa Pakistan to, to surrender to the Indian army on the, on the Rajasthan border and come across and then go, uh, then be sort of uh, shepherded by the Indian army into, into Bangladesh and join the Mukti Bahini. And so, so in that time, we, we heard his story and we were, of course, I mean, he was, 
sort of you know the, the typical tall dark and handsome uh, young man and everybody all of us were sort of uh, you know enchanted by him including one of uh, the bangladeshi women in calcutta the the sort of deputy high commissioner's daughter who was who fell in love who was already in love with him and who was actually sort of kidnapped uh, because uh, against his parents wishes because the parents did not want uh, her their daughter to marry a mukti mukti jodha whose uh, sort of uh, you know expected lifetime would be not not too 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 much so anyway they married and everything was going well once we actually i remember uh, seeing him in in august he he came to our house uh, maybe after 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 being away for about 3 weeks and one of his his, his left hands was sort of hanging by, by with, with 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 some with, by some skin it was completely blown off by a by a shell so he was of course out of action for some time and all that but then he went back to bangladesh he was he was promoted to 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 major uh, initially but as salil would probably know uh, that at that time the the pakistani army was not on very good terms with with sheikh mujib so sheikh mujib was not uh, very happy with the pakistani army he was afraid of you know the army getting getting too powerful and forming martial law or something like that so he had his own militia he had his own rokhi rokhi bahini which you know is just like a kind of kind of banana republic so that and he was his he and his sons were getting too powerful his nephews were uh, were uh, you know occupying things and one of his henchmen uh, gazi gulam mustafa was the head of the uh, of the pakistani of the bangladeshi rokhi bahini and overall it was becoming fast becoming like a like a dictatorship in fact it was a dictatorship by by 1974 when another thing happened that you know in major dalim's uh, house there was a, there was a marriage party there was a wedding wedding ceremony in which uh, you know gazi gulam mustafa's people came and they insulted some of you know major major dalim's wife uh, sort of relatives and there was immediately some some sort of escalation uh, major uh, these uh, gazi gulam mustafa's Rocky Bahini came and they actually kidnapped uh, Dalim and Dalim's wife and mother-in-law. They took him to the Rocky Bahini headquarters, but on the way they they got a little scared by by by, by what Dalim said. He said that you know, so many people have seen this this kind of thing, thing happening that you can't get away with it. So what he did is that they 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 went to Mujib's house at 1:30 at night and asked him to intervene. So Mujib tried his best to sort of patch up between Dalim and Gazi Gula Musafa. um D- dalim said that he he blamed uh, gazi but whatever it happened i mean they 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 sort of fell apart after that and the army is, uh, and uh, you know dalim's friends and all that they sort of formed their own coterie they met, met up with farooq farooq colonel farooq who was not colonel at that time and then you know what happened we all know what happened so this was not the flashpoint but this was one of the flashpoints that was actually that is actually responsible for for this and this we have seen for, sort of through our own eyes sort of developing so it is it is very uh, strange that you know when dalim went back to pakistan mujib was his god and the god fell fell from grace within within a very very short time really and i think that story applies to a lot of bangladeshis who also felt the same way that you know they did uh, and which is exactly why the events turned out the way they did and the way the people responded to it. absolutely absolutely right yeah and you you're right about talking about uh, authoritarian and dictatorship because in early january of 1975 mujib declared a one party state you know he created this bakshal bangladesh awami krishak shromam bangladesh krishak shrom shromik awami league is the name he gave to the party bakshal and 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 the, and you know the newspapers were closed down to make them into one each and so on yeah events of history have little seeds that um, you know that pushan has been witness to or has heard about and so funny things that happen you know there's <clears throat> but anyway i think we are uh, closing on in an hour to an hour and this will be a good time we had some stories as we promised from different parts of this bangladesh war and this whole thing you know that is latched on to the language and the sense of the language so i've requested uh, moshumi if we can end this with a few lines from one of our songs so if moshumi if you please okay sure if i could ask you if you were the right person we'll come to the questions afterwards maybe we can yeah we can uh, end this and then we'll be on time and then we can have some question answers if you don't mind thank you moshumi please yeah uh, 
So the, the question of what is secular, that's one of the questions I think that's become one of the more um, sort of the, the, the question that's driving a lot of uh, intelligentsia now. So even amongst, you know, scholars, writers, historians, uh, in, in present day Bangladesh, the question of what does it mean to be secular? And are we secular? Do we need to be secular? What is secular? Why can't we be Muslim and, there, and yet be sort of open-minded and, you know, accommodating of others? Why can't we be an Islamic state as well as be accommodating of others? These are the questions that many of my sort of, you know, friends are also asking. So, and so it becomes a different take on the whole question of the war. And the whole question of the war, which is, and so the legitimacy of Pakistan is also, I mean, uh, it's reclaimed, you know, the legitimacy. So because Pakistan was a dream, and why not? Why, why should we say that Pakistan was a bad dream? Pakistan was also a dream of many people. And that dream was also, that, that dream um, had to, it, it didn't end well. But it could have been, uh, uh, it, it was a revolution of sorts because people were, people and oppressed people were claiming things for themselves and autonomy for themselves. And that's, that is also the story behind Pakistan. So all these things, so who is the wrongdoer and what is wrong is a big question. So I think I'll just sing a few lines from a song by a poet from um, Silet. I learned the song from his grandson. This poet was a uh, peer, so a um, uh, thinker, a poet, and a healer. So he says, um, Oh, my friend, what is it that makes me a wrongdoer? And so it goes, um, Prano nat bun thure. And in a war, it, I mean, there are wrongdoers on every side. Apadadhe hoi lama mi ekon bichare. Prano nat bun thure. Apadadhe hoi lama mi. Okay, so my what I have what what I hold inside me, I can't speak because I've locked the the gates of my heart. Hurke de lam ghare prano bundhu aje. Aparadhe hoi lama mi ekon bichare. Bundhu re. Eko mushti khago diya. Raikha soya domba naya haro dilai jibon tar bhi tare ho bunthure. So just with a handful of earth, with a handful of dust, you make me a human and you put uh, life into me. Adi hoite eki From the beginning of time, there's been the same mother. So we are so frightened of difference 
And that's why we can't live with difference. I think that's the problem. Bhaye kaapi bhinna tari dare O bundhu, bundhu are O paradhi hoi la mami ekon bichare So thank you very much and really thank you. We're really lucky to have this group of people. Salil joining for New York, from New York and Pushanda coming down um, the, from uh, the suburbs and of course Moshumi. And this discussion and Moshumi's stay for the few days actually changes the tenor of our regular day-to-day -day existence in TIFR where we only worry about our labs and our science. This sort of adds a dimension that I really love that uh, people who arrange it, mainly Bhashwati and Jay Kumar, I thank them. Thank all of you for being part of it. We are lucky that she's still here for two more days and she's giving talks and obviously there is a concert on Sunday. So I hope to see all of you there and chat, interact while she's still here. And let's chat also with each other about things that we have discussed today. So thank you very much, uh, Salil. A full day ahead for you. And thank you, uh, Pushan. Thank you, um, oh, thank you, Moshumi. <coughs> we have a couple of questions, but I don't know how much time we have. So okay. So then we have a time for a question. Um, Well, <clears throat> a quick question. How do you see the evolution of Bengali language in West Bengal and Bangladesh? Are they parallel or are there some differences? I don't know so much. I mean, these are very difficult no, questions. No, because you have been interacting, going to Bangladesh. Yeah, looking, uh, so you must be knowing much better than me. Yeah, uh, but I think I've seen for the last 20, 25 years, I've seen the language change in both places. You see, I've seen Bangla change in both places. When we used to go at, in the mid 1990s to Bangladesh, the it was uh, uh, Bangla was was the main thing. It now English is really there's a lot of English now. In in and you see the, the so the importance and the need for English has been felt and so, sort of if you open the market, you become more global then. It's, it's over the last 25 years, that has certainly happened a lot. I see that in Bangladesh. And, uh, and uh, also Bollywood, the proliferation of Bollywood. So people also see Hindi films and they, they have also learned. So the solving of the language, things have changed, you know, but while they are not going to allow, uh, so there will be that, uh, uh, that, that very um, rigid and uh, uh, sort of conservative group of, um, of um, Awami Leaguers, uh, who, the student faction, who did not allow Kawali, Kawali to be sung on, on, in, on Dhaka University campus. And I think that's also a shame. I mean, it's it it's a blemish on a language on on a uh, on a uh, language that was born uh, on a on a state that was born uh, with this idea of the freedom of language. And then, if you repress another language, uh, I think it, it it's a shame. We become apuradhi when we do that. And uh, but here in West Bengal, like Bangla, what can I say? <laughs> how many how many people speak Bangla in this okay. I we have a question at the back. Yeah, right. There. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. So I oh, have can a, you turn it on? I don't think you have it's on. It's on. It's on. Yeah. It's on yeah. So hold it closer. So uh, I have a question to uh, uh, you, sir. That uh, yeah. No, no. Salil. Salil. Yes. So as a uh, as a journalist, how you? Uh, I mean, we have discussed the uh, past, present, we have covered uh, things for the societal thing, recent uh, destruction and uh, uh, all, all those. Uh, how you how you see the future? Like, I mean, uh, I mean, 
recent the go governmental uh, so action like uh, i mean on one side we can see they are reconstructing the ramnakali temple on the other hand the educational side like that is the main thing uh, how much fraction of bangladeshi student youth they can get proper uh, government education uh, also we can see that like some sort of uh, i mean i recently i just learned that uh, the, the the authors poets who are uh, atheist or so called non believers they they are they are uh, um, the poem are banned uh, yeah, yeah. from the government so uh, so this sort of balancing thing from the government so how, how you as a poll, i mean journalist how you see the future from now so that is also very important uh, i mean i mean of course your opinion because i mean so that is uh, my question yeah I, so i'm not a, i'm not going to predict because i'm very bad at it uh, you know i thought britain wouldn't leave uh, europe it did i thought trump wouldn't win but he def did defeat clinton so i will not make any predictions there but all the points you have said are true and i think that's one of the thing that we journalists and uh, even I mean, more more important than me historians also have to note in mind is to go as far as evidence can take you and accept that it's a nuanced complex society like every other society so everything you say is true that yes there are attacks on hindu minorities and yes the government feels ashamed about it and rebuilds the temple yes there are atheist poets who can publish and yes the bloggers have been killed between 2013 and 16 about 9 to 12 bloggers were killed yes the bangladesh values freedom and likes to quote where the mind is without fear of tagore as we do in india and at the same time poets and writers have been in jail shahidul alam the famous photographer was in jail for 100 days a few years ago um journalists are disappearing all of that does happen so all of these are part of and that churning essentially will have to be decided locally now it's it's fast turning into what looks like a one party state now because either there are allegations fairly credible allegations that the elections are not fair um and you know the opposition is literally you know i mean uh, it's it's in, there in name only uh, and the awami league is exceptionally popular it is exceptionally reliant on one family um i don't know what the line of succession is either in the ruling party or in the opposite the main opposition bnp uh, they don't really have that in if you go to dhaka and moshumi will know this a lot of people speak of what is called a minus 2 solution which is you know essentially what they say that a, a future of bangladesh without hasina or khalida playing a prominent role or in a, in a sense the two prominent political families um, to be not playing that kind of a role but uh, at the same time they have a huge hold over the over the electoral politics and they do continue to keep winning so it will be a churning within the country and i think ultimately bangladesh will have to come to a conclusion within about the kind of society it wants to be and since we are talking about poems and song i'll just quote one last line from i mean i, I do have a couple of things to add but at rayer bazar there is a monument and again moshu me will remember this monument it's a monument in in memory of the martyred intellectuals because on the 14th of december pakistan realized that they were losing the war and between 14th and 16th they took away close to 100 intellectuals and they were killed uh, mercilessly killed and at that time uh, there is a monument now at this place called rayer bazar where asad choudhry has written a poem and that poem is written there which is a searching probing existential question for bangladesh tumader ja bolar chilo bolche ki ta bangladesh does bangladesh say what you wanted to say and this is a kind of question that those who went are asking the generation today and the, in a way some entity is asking them that you know the kind of bangladesh you want is it becoming that or not and it is an imperfect society and you know i think you alluded to the the economic progress and that's certainly amazing it's not just the economic progress but even in terms of uh, social indicators you know um, female participation in labor force uh, infant mortality on all these bangladesh is doing better than india and pakistan in many social indices not all of them but in many social indices now how to build on that and then to make sure that it recaptures the original dream of 1971 where you know temples and mosques are both protected and people's respect and people's faith is being respected that's the challenge whether it will happen i don't know but all the indicators you point out are correct i mean yes that's exactly what's happening now how to reassemble them and craft a new nation is something only bangladesh can decide 
one last question from no other person than Jack. No, no. Uh, I think uh, I found something missing in the discussion. As an outsider, one heard a lot about women empowerment and their driving the economy and those aspects probably it needs another discussion. But is it true that there has been a transformation in Bangladeshi society in terms of the status of women since uh, since the war? So, yeah, so, yeah, so uh, uh, a short answer, I mean, if we go by economic indicators and statistics, the answer is yes, because uh, if you look at um, positions of influence, I mean, forget about politics itself, but you do find many women in prominent, in the civil society of Bangladesh, you know, whether it is NGOs and so on, largely women led, women are also prominent in the, in, 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 you know, in, in academics and in teaching and so on. And at the same time, like all complicated societies, you do have um, instances of gross violence against women. I mean, uh, after COVID, we did a report recently, I mean, recently meaning a year ago, after the COVID crisis, when uh, factories were restarting, the garment factories were restarting, uh, women were less likely to get jobs immediately, and the wages they were getting were substantially lower than, than, than the, the men were getting. So that, that kind of disparity is still there. So it's again, a work in progress story, but I think there is a lot that uh, they can uh, be proud of. It's just in terms of you know indicators that Amartya Sen would say are critical, female literacy, um, uh, uh, fewer children per women, uh, and, uh, and infant mo maternal mortality rates. Um, it is doing well, and therefore, if you project it, and if, if the opportunities that are rightfully theirs go their way, then I think they would do incredibly well, yeah. Okay, I think we end on the dear hope that Bangladesh becomes a beacon of progress in our uh, neighborhood. And we'll be looking forward to that. 50 years is not a very large number for a nation, we are 75. So let's see how things pan out, but not all is dark. That's what I get from this discussion. And Bangla is very much alive. I do read some of the Bangladeshi writers. They're very powerful writers and I'm very glad that I can read them in my mother tongue. So that's really nice. So let's thank all of our panelists and let's thank everybody. <laughs>